This recording is based on a presentation I did on the 13th of April 2022 at a workshop at Stellenbosch University called Tense Time Aspect Mood Modality in African Languages. I'm recording it as a public service and in order to engage with anyone who might be interested. If you have thoughts or ideas or would like to talk about this more generally, please don't hesitate to get in contact with me. Copyright is by Mark DeFoss 2022, all rights reserved. No part of this document or lecture content may be reproduced without my express written consent. However, if you would like to cite it or refer to it in an academic context, please feel free to do so using appropriate citation methods. Before we talk about past tense constructions in Afrikaans, let's overview some of the basics. Afrikaans is a West Germanic language spoken widely in Southern Africa, and it is closely related to Dutch, although it has influences from many, many languages. The central range of Afrikaans focuses on the western half of South Africa and southern Namibia. And in this area, more than 80% of people living in those areas speak Afrikaans as their first language. It is South Africa's third largest language, with about 13% of South Africans speaking it as their home language, which amounts to about 6 million people. And there are about 500,000 speakers in Namibia and elsewhere. It's important to realize when you talk about Afrikaans that it is not really one monolithic entity. There are different kinds of Afrikaanses, and there always have been. For instance, we have the Eastern or Standard Afrikaans originating in the western part of the Eastern Cape, and which has since spread throughout the country as the Standard. We also have Carps, characteristic of the Western and Southern Cape, as well as so-called coloured Afrikaans, which may or may not be related or the same thing as Carps, but which is spoken outside of the Western Southern Cape. We also have multiple varieties of Northern Afrikaans, uh, Orange River Afrikaans, uh, Namibia Afrikaans, or Afrikaanses, amongst many others. Finally, I think it's really important to acknowledge that there are many second language varieties of Afrikaans, Many people speak Afrikaans as a second language, and this is a characteristic which has probably always been true during the history of Afrikaans. So at least for the last 350 years, we have probably had situations where there are large numbers of second language speakers who also have an impact on the structure of the language. When we talk about verbs in Afrikaans, it's important to note that lexical verbs do not inflect for finiteness, but they retain their bare root form with the exceptions of have and be. If you look at the table below, you'll notice that the infinitival form, um to lo, bo, and le, has exactly the same form as the finite, loop, bo, and le. The exception is uh, have and be. We're going to look at have here. The infinitival form of have is um to he, which is actually a lexical verb. When that verb occurs in situations that are not linked to the omta infinitive or the overt infinitive, it takes the form het. That, that means that het is both the finite form and the non-finite form of the verb, accepting true infinitives. Also note that have and be can both be auxiliaries, and we're going to be looking at the auxiliaries of have in this paper. When we're talking about the past tense, Afrikaans is only a single periphrastic past tense, which is superficially similar to the present perfect in related languages such as Dutch or German. Now, having only a single past tense contrasts with all the other West Germanic languages, in fact, all the other Germanic languages, which have multiple past tenses, such as simple preterite forms, as well as more complex past forms. In example one, you'll see how the Afrikaans past tense is built. We have an auxiliary, het, followed by a verb root which has a prefix, g. Now, this also contrasts with Dutch and German and related languages, which make the equivalent tense form with a circumfix. So, in example two, you'll see a Dutch example. The auxiliary can be either have or be. So, Afrikaans only has the auxiliary have. The participle itself is made up of a prefix, g, the verb root, and the suffix. The suffix can be t or d, which is, I think, usually phonologically conditioned, and there are some verb forms which take suppleta forms of the suffix, such as en. With those building blocks in place, I think we are able to look at the puzzle, or one of the puzzles that I will be focusing on in this talk today. 
Example three shows a typical example of the past tense. So this is a verbal participle used in its uh, clausal function. Uh, and you'll notice that the word gebak consists of the verb root and the prefix. And this is exactly what you would have been led to expect by the previous slides. However, when we use a verbal participle as an adjective, we'll note that a suffix emerges. So in example four, die gebak to cook, you'll notice the verb root is preceded by the prefix and followed by a suffix, t. And this seems rather unusual given the massive reduction of the verbal paradigm uh, in Afrikaans and the fact that we don't see this kind of suffix occurring in the prototypical use of the, the participle, it seems then rather odd that it would still emerge in the adjectival usage. On the way to answering this, we're going to have to take a series of deviations. We're going to start off by looking at the semantics of the Afrikaans past tense. From that, we're going to infer a plausible uh, syntactic structure to underpin it. And then we're going to use that syntactic structure to derive a number of other properties uh, of the past tense and phenomena associated with it. And by the end of the talk, we will return to the same puzzle and see if we have a possible solution for it. In order to analyze our Afrikaans past tense, we're going to be using uh, the system of Reichenbach, 1947, who held that all tenses can be captured via a complex relation between speech time, which is typically the now world of the speaker and the hearer in discourse, the event time, which is the period over which a, a verbal event takes place, and the reference time, which are points of temporal reference in the sentence, usually indicated by things such as adverbials and or context. So, to start our analysis, we're going to look at the relationship between the reference time and the speech time in Afrikaans. And here's our first example. Yesterday I went to church entails a speech time which is now, a yesterday time which is a period of time which precedes yesterday, and a church going event which overlaps with the reference time so it occurred yesterday. Important to note here is we are just going to look at the relationship between reference time and speech time, and in this example, reference time precedes speech time. We can check this by inserting other adverbials, and in example 6, so it shows an example, we have used a future-oriented adverbial tomorrow, which results in the following kind of semantics, where the speech time is in the now, and the reference time, namely tomorrow, occurs after the speech time at some point. And this is ungrammatical in Afrikaans, uh, which shows that, indeed, reference time must precede the speech time. Now, this might seem trivially obvious until one realizes that in Afrikaans, an example like six is indeed compatible with the present perfect, which is the tense that is ostensibly most similar to the Afrikaans past tense. Uh, so immediately we see from example six that Afrikaans differs with respect to its Dutch counterpart. Let's now turn attention to the relationship between event time and reference time. And we have an example on the screen, which semantics is indicated by the English version. While he wrote his exam, he drank a Red Bull. And the idea here is you've got a speech time in the now, preceded by an exam writing event, which is going to act as our, uh, our reference time. And during that exam writing event, it was a Red Bull drinking event. So this suggests then that reference time and event time can be co-synchronous. Let's double check that by using other adverbials. So example A shows an example where I have inserted the adverbial klaar, which creates a, a completed event. And this shifts the meaning somewhat to the diagram where after he had finished his exam, uh, he drank the Red Bull. So this example, although using exactly the same tenses and borrowed structure as example 7, shows that we can coerce a perfective meaning from this where reference time precedes the event time. We can also use examples like for in number 9, which creates the semantics such that before writing his exam, he drank a Red Bull. And so it seems in Afrikaans, we have a full range of possibilities with respect to event time and reference time. And so, event time and reference time are not inherently ordered in relation to each other. 
I'm going to indicate that with an E comma R. This yields a total analysis as R, R before S, or reference time precedes speech time, and E and R are unordered with respect to each other. This is very similar to the specification of the Dutch imperfect, incidentally. However, just as an aside, it is important to note that a lot of authors use the notation E, R to indicate that event time and reference time are strictly co-synchronous. While Afrikaans is compatible with this meaning, it is certainly not the only meaning associated with the past tense, and as such is important to distinguish the notation we've used here, which represents an unordered relation, as compared to another kind of notation which might indicate a co-synchronous relation. So we're just noting that E and R are not ordered in relation to each other. This brings us to the next question is, how does aspect fit into this picture? The previous examples already show that the present perfect, if that's what we want to call Afrikaans, does not necessarily encode perfective events. My diagnostic for uh, identifying a perfective event is that the internal structure of a perfective event cannot be modified by external clauses. So it ought not to be possible to overlap a perfective event with another kind of event. Let's have a look at example 7 again. What we'll note here is that while there was an exam writing event, which is the reference time, there is also a Red Bull drinking event, which occurs at the same time. So this is clearly an imperfective kind of semantics. If we want to find out how different that is in Dutch, please bear with me as we look at some Dutch examples. So the basic context here is that it is autumn and uh, leaves change color in autumn. And the question is, when exactly that happened. So let's use the Dutch present perfect, which looks superficially similar to the Afrikaans present perfect, but which we already know it has got different specifications. If we use this tense to express this kind of situation, we have a set, the meaning where the leaf changing event occurs and is finished before autumn arrives. So this is a perfective meaning, which is why it's called the Dutch present perfect. If we look at the Dutch imperfective to express the same kind of uh, situation, the semantics is such that during autumn, the leaves changed. The leaf changing event is overlapping with the, the lengthy event of autumn. And this is exactly what you would expect from an imperfect construction. And this is quite interesting. If you use the Afrikaans past tense to express this, it typically would have the same kind of semantics as the Dutch imperfect. Now that is, doesn't mean that the imperfect is the only meaning associated with Afrikaans, because if we use different kinds of adverbials, we can coerce different kinds of meetings out, meanings out of it, which shows that the Afrikaans past tense is actually very flexible. But importantly here, it's not the case that we would want to call the Afrikaans past tense perfect. It just seems to be underspecified. Putting all this together, we're going to need some theoretical apparatus. Broadly speaking, I consider myself a minimalist and will be drawing on that tradition of syntactic theorizing. However, there's nothing particularly minimalist about the analysis I'm going to be presenting today, not least of which will be drawing on Reichenbach 1947, which we've already talked about. Tenses are all compound tenses encoded by two relations, the relationship between reference time and speech time and the relationship between reference time and event time. Now, how do we get that into a syntactic structure? I'm going to be drawing on Georgian and Pianese 1997, as well as a number of others. They suggested that you can take these Reichenbachian relations and capture them into syntactic projections. Let's call those T1 and T2 for the sake of convenience. And that gives us the structure in the right-hand corner, where T1 dominates T2. Importantly to note that when other people have done analyses of this sort, exact locations of T1 and T2 vary. So it might be the case that T1 is fairly high up in the functional structure, and T2 is inside the verbal structure. I'm going to be agnostic about that, and simply taking the null assumption that T1 immediately dominates T2. However, there have been some critiques of this kind of structure, specifically in how it deals with aspect. 
Crucially, Georgian Pianesi attempted to derive the aspectual meanings from the feature specifications of R, S, and E. And this has been critiqued by a number of people. Bertinetta and Bianchi argued that it would appear that the aspectual specification seems to work independently of R, S, and E. So I will be taking that on board. Also, there is, I would say, clear evidence of an articulated aspectual phrase in West Germanic immediately above the VP or in the high VP area. So I will be using the following kind of structure in today's analysis. T1P, which mediates the relationship between reference time and speech time. A T2P, mediating the relationship reference time and event time. And an aspect P, which mediates relationships such as perfectivity, completivity, etc. It also happens to be rather convenient because for the present perfect constructions, we actually have three heads that are involved. There is the G prefix head, there is the T suffix head, and we have the auxiliary head as well. So having three heads and three projections seems to me an interesting place to start. Incidentally, when I draw my trees, I sprinkle them liberally with morphological heads. And that is important to notice, just a convenient shorthand. I'm assuming a distributed morphology type of system, where heads are bundles of abstract features, and the exact morphological form is determined from this feature bundle at a spell-out point. A possible Dutch-like structure might look like the following where we have an aspectual phrase dominating our verb phrase. The aspect P is headed by the prefix G. Above that, we have our T2 phrase, which mediates the relationship between event time and reference time. And I'm going to be taking this to be lexicalized as a suffix. And above that, we have T1 phrase, which also doubles as a projection where the auxiliary is inserted. So it's a kind of an auxiliary phrase. And this mediates the relationship between reference time and speech time. How our typical derivation might proceed is that we take our lexical verb, it raises to little v, it raises to aspect phrase where it gets the prefix, then it raises to t2 where it gets the t suffix. And this gives us our g root t kind of formula. And then finally, after that, we insert our auxiliary into T1 phrase, which mediates the relationship between R and S, and thereafter the uh, auxiliary raises up to infill. So that's the basic Dutch type structure. By the way, if you are wondering why in this particular tree R is co-synchronous with S and E precedes R, why do we have those particular specifications as opposed to the specifications argued for before? These specifications in this tree refer to the Dutch specifications for the present perfect, not the Afrikaans, but we will get to the Afrikaans in the next slide. One of the important components of this kind of analysis is the idea that the G prefix is the head of the aspect phrase. Is there any evidence for that? I would suggest that there certainly is. And we can see that from the fact that the Dutch G prefix is in complementary distribution with spectral markers such as B, R, Her, Fer, and Ont. These are so the so-called inseparable prefixes. Verbs that begin with these prefixes do not inflect for G. So you can take the verb planter to plant, and in the past tense it becomes geplant. There is also a related verb, beplante, meaning to plant completely. In the past tense, beplant remains beplant. It doesn't become ge beplant. And that's because ge and be are in complementary distribution. And from that, we can infer that they are competing for the same head position. And if that's the case, then it's quite likely that ge is in an aspectual head preceding the verb phrase. Incidentally, formal standard Afrikaans also has this kind of complementary distribution, but as I will show later on, it is not as strict as in Dutch and tends to break down under certain conditions. Looking back at our Dutch style of tree, I would like to show how we can derive the Afrikaans kind of structure from it. And it's important to do this, I think, for two reasons. One is just to show the continuity between Dutch and Afrikaans, 
And the other one is that if we regard Afrikaans as a grammaticalized system, or a system which has undergone historical change, it is important to understand the syntactic inputs that may have been present in the early Cape Colony. Now, you may have noticed that for the sake of convenience, I am using a contemporary Dutch syntactic structure here. But I am very aware that there is a logical fallacy on my part insofar as the Dutch syntactic input to early Afrikaans would have been Middle Dutch and not contemporary Dutch. However, I don't think much hinges on that insofar as it is quite possible that there was a common syntactic input which resulted on the one hand in contemporary Dutch and on the other hand in Afrikaans. But for the sake of convenience, let's see how this kind of historical change may have taken place. So we have our Dutch structure here in the diagram and we need to realize that Afrikaans has undergone extensive grammaticalization, not least of which the Afrikaans past tense. And grammaticalization entails the loss of lexical function and the acquiring of more grammatical function over time. Abema, 2002, made an interesting observation about the degree of grammaticalization and the position in a hierarchical syntactic tree. Now, this can be seen really clearly in languages where we have complementizers, which are derived from verbs, specifically verbs of speech. So when the verb of speech occurs inside a VP position, it is ungrammaticalized and has its full lexical function. However, when it's high up in the structure, it occurs as a complementizer and seems to have lost a lot of that lexical function and gained grammatical function. So Abema theorized this as a form of upward reanalysis where heads that are lower in the tree are reanalyzed into higher functional projections, whereby they take on a more functional role. How this could have occurred in Afrikaans is the following. The head of the aspect phrase, ch, is reanalyzed over time as the head of T2, which is above it. T2, you'll remember, mediates the relationship between event time and reference time. As it grammaticalizes into that position, the specification of ENR thus changes to the modern Afrikaans, which is E, R, or ENR having no relation in respect of each other, no ordering relation. Simultaneously, or around the same time, the T head is reanalyzed as belonging to T1. So it effectively moves from the head of T2 to the head of T1, and in so doing, adjusts the a relationship between reference time and speech time to the contemporary Afrikaans value, which is reference time preceding speech time. Now, there is an interesting and tantalizing possibility, which I'm going to briefly allude to here, but will not develop in much detail. And that is the idea that the T marker in Dutch is specified with a past relationship expressed as a function. And when it is grammaticalized into the next higher position as the head of T1, it retains that past function, but it applies it to the arguments R and S. So if you take R and S and apply a past function to them, the output would be R precedes S, which is exactly what we get in uh, contemporary Afrikaans. So there's a possibility here, which I will lead to others to uh, explore in more detail, that the present Afrikaans feature specification might be predictable from an earlier Dutch one. Let's clean up our tree a little bit to yield the following Afrikaans structure, where we have the aspectual head, which is empty, or it may contain inseparable prefixes, or perhaps even separable prefixes in its specifier, but otherwise remains underspecified. The ER relation is located in T2, and it's lexicalized by the prefix G, and the R and S relation is mediated by a T1 phrase and is lexicalized as a suffix, namely the T. Now, how is this going to work? Well, first of all, our big V raises to little v, as would be expected. And thereafter, one might imagine it could head raise to the head of aspect phrase and to the head of T2. However, I don't think that is necessary at all. Rather, we could use morphological merge following Marantz 1988 and many subsequent people after that 
And the idea of morphological merge is that adjacent heads in the structure are simply spelled out as a single word by the morphology without head movement needing to take place. Let's take it that that is what we're dealing with there. Then after that we can take our auxiliary hair and merge it into the head of T1 whereby it obtains a suffix t yielding het. And thereafter our auxiliary hair or het can move to infill or wherever it wants to go after that. Now what I'm suggesting here is that the past tense auxiliary het is morphologically complex, consisting of a root and a suffix t. And that, I think, is by no means uncontentious. What I'm saying, then, is that the t suffix remains in the syntactic structure, but is effectively rendered invisible because it occurs on het. Now, is there any evidence for this? There are three types of evidence I want to talk about today. The first is complementary distribution between ch and the inseparable prefixes. The next kind of evidence will be about ch preceding certain kinds of aspectual verbs. And finally, I want to return to the adjectival puzzle we began this talk with, which is the issue around the adjectival participles retaining the t suffix. If we look at the inseparable prefixes in Afrikaans, there is a complementary distribution between these and ch in formal standard Afrikaans. However, it breaks down in colloquial standard Afrikaans as well as many other dialectal forms. And it's really not hard to find these kinds of constructions. So here's an example from Orange River Afrikaans, gebegrave instead of begrave. So you'd imagine that ch and b are on complementary distribution, but they are not Geverstaan from Orange River Afrikaans, and here's another one from Neisner Boswerker Afrikaans, Geverslaap. Uh, in all these examples, you would expect the G not to be present. And you can find this in many, many, many varieties of Afrikaans. It really is kind of productive and seems to be mediated by individual preference rather than any grammatical rule per se. So what does this suggest? That G and B are not in complementary distribution in Afrikaans as they would be in Dutch. Therefore, they are not competing for the same position. To the extent that B is in the head of the spectral phrase, it strongly suggests that the G must be higher up in the structure. We can also see evidence for the structure from so-called anti-IPP effects. In Dutch and German and Afrikaans, certain semi-aspectual or modal-like light verbs can precede verbs in a functional hierarchy. In languages like Dutch, these light or light verbs or modal verbs are in strict complementary distribution with ge, and this is known as the IPP effect. What does this show? That ge and the aspectual verbs are in the same position in Dutch. Now, I'm not going to show examples of that, but jump right to Afrikaans. In Afrikaans, they are not in such strict complementary distribution. Here's an example. In 16, you can see the construction gelaat fal. Fal is our lexical verb. It's preceded by a causative verb lat or laat. And our participle prefix occurs on that light verb, yielding gelaat fal, which broadly means to drop. Here's another example. Gebleid dun. Dun is our lexical verb. It is preceded by an aspectual light verb, blay, and our participle form precedes that. What is this suggesting? Well, it suggests that blay and light might head a aspectual phrase somewhere in the functional hierarchy above the VP, and that the ch is preceding that position. In other words, ch and these aspectual verbs do not compete for the same position, but ch is higher in the structure. This is consistent with what we've been arguing. Finally, let's turn to adjectives. As we said in the beginning of the talk, there is an asymmetry between participles when used as verbs versus participles used as adjectives. Namely, verbal participles lack the suffix, but adjectival participles have a suffix. Here you can see examples in 18 and 19. Gekoop and gebak are verbal participles used in their verbal function. And you see the prefix and no suffix. However, when you use the adjective, the suffix appears, gekoopte motor or gebakte brood. Now, why might that be? Let's look at the structure we've been arguing for Afrikaans. The assumptions I'm making are that adjectival participles are derived using exactly the same clausal structure, except that they are selected 
by an adjectival phrase at the very top, and that's what you see at the very top of the tree. I'm also assuming that for whatever independent reasons, there's no auxiliary in the structure to support the t suffix, so there will not be a het in this structure. In order to derive our adjective, what happens is that the big V must head move to, to little v. It then head moves through aspect P to the head of T2, and this yields the G and the root structure. However, because T is a bound affix and needs to be supported, but there is no auxiliary to support it in this structure, I think it's necessary for the verb complex then to move higher to the head of T1 and adjoin to the suffix yielding G, root, and T. With respect to the schwa ending T, TE, I don't really have a story about that. I'm simply assuming it's actually that that reflects a yet higher head uh, indicating an adjective. So it's quite possible that the verbal root uh, t structure head moves one step higher to the adjective head yielding gebakta or gekoopta. Okay, so what's really interesting about this is that we can derive the asymmetry between adjectival and verbal participles fairly easily. We use the same structure to do both, so we don't need really any ancillary explanations around that. It also, I think, gives some evidence that the t the T suffix has not been lost to the structure. It still is in the structure, but is usually just camouflaged by the fact that it is suffixed to the auxiliary head. So to summarize, the Afrikaans so-called present perfect is neither present nor perfect. It is really just an underspecified past tense. It consists of a past auxiliary and an underspecified participle form. The suffix is reanalyzed as the head of T1, with the relationship R precedes S. The prefix, G, is reanalyzed as the head of T2, with the specification R and E being unordered in relation to each other. And aspect remains unspecified. It is this set of feature values that give the Afrikaans past tense its particular flexibility to be able to express a wide variety of events. We can use this to explain a number of different phenomena under a single analysis. First of all, an oddity in the infinitive finite pr paradigm with respect to hair versus het. We can explain the lack of complementary distribution among inseparable prefixes, as well as complementary distribution with respect to their spectral linking verbs, the so-called anti-IPP effects. And finally, we have an explanation for the asymmetry between the adjectival and verbal uses of participles with respect to the suffix. Thank you very much. I am open for talking, or if you have any ideas or points you want to raise, if you want to agree with me or disagree with me, I'd be very happy to engage with you. Please feel welcome to get in touch.